Free Golden Eagles for War Thunder. Download the app in the description below. Hey guys, welcome back to War Thunder and welcome to some 163 Comet gameplay. There are only two real reasons why I'm doing this video. One is that the last video, which was nearly a year old, on the 163 got a huge amount of views. And I want to kind of remake it because it was very badly made. But the second one is that I was playing tank matches a couple of weeks ago. And I had that one match, you know, where you spawn in. You drive a little bit, you get to the center of the map, you look around, you don't see anything, you pop out behind a corner, and boom, there's ten Russian tanks. Boom, one shot. So I bailed out, and as I got to the hangar, there was the battle trophy. And it's spinning, and spinning, and I, I wasn't even paying attention, you know, I was thinking, oh yeah, here comes another 10,000, you know, silver lions. I get a talisman. Can you guess what the talisman was on? Yeah, that's right, the, the 163. <laughs> It's like, out of all the possible planes, at tier 5, or even at late tier 4, I got a talisman on the 163. The one plane that's been spaded for years, the one plane that I don't fly at very often, and the one plane I don't really like to fly at very often. But not because it would be a bad plane. Just watch the video and enjoy it. Because this is one hell of a weird match. And speaking of this match, it's very rare that I upload matches Recorded on the day the video is supposed to go out. That should tell you a lot about the fact that I had a lot of problems getting footage for this thing. The 163 is an issue of its own. Well, the Kai 200 falls in the same category, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes, because that's just what I'm going to meet. The 163's main problem is the fuel. You get a solid six minutes of fuel, and, and six minutes might sound like plenty, up until the point you spawn on Spain and realize that the map is so big that it will take three minutes just to get to the other side. And fuel won't be the only thing you'll be conserving. 120 shells on two Mark 108 cannons that are going to be a pain in the ass to lead. And so Shady had on passes as much as they might seem a smart idea in a, well, 262, in the 163 I simply just can't do them. And I know, taking stealth shells is not the smartest idea, but it makes me feel better about myself, so that works. The 163's biggest problem is, it's not even a jet, it's a rocket. That's, that's where the first confusion comes in, the 163 and the Kai 200 are rocket aircraft. And where the real issue is, is that both of them are the first rocket, or call it jet, you will unlock. You see, a person goes from flying the BF-109 K4 at a ballering of 5.3 to flying a ME-163 at 8.0. That sounds like a problem we've covered a hundred times over. It's an entry-level jet that doesn't fight other entry-level jets. Yeah, that's where one of the biggest problems comes in. But even that's not the biggest problem. You know, having an entry-level jet that fights top-tier jets can be handled. You know, hell, the attacker can hold on its own. Hell, the meteor can hold on its own. Where the issue is is that the plane has no characteristics of a jet. You see, what you will learn when you fly the 163 is not applicable anywhere else. It's a unique plane on its own. And I think that's the only reason why anyone should ever go and fly this thing out extensively. Well, that, or if you get a talisman on it like I did, and then you're kind of forced to fly it out. Which isn't that bad of a thing, after all. Um, the issue with the 163 again, it, it, it has a lot of restrictions, you know, the amount of ammunition you can carry, the amount of fuel you've got, you're always going to be restricted to the map size, but primarily it's the players you'll be facing. Now, a lot of other 8.0 planes, whilst they're going to be faster than you, they're not faster by that much. Whilst they can turn sharp, they won't turn as sharply as you, whilst they can climb good, they won't climb that well. So, at an 8.0 BR, the plane is actually very good. But as soon as it starts meeting the late 9.0, the, you know, top performing jets, that discussion we had hundreds of times over, things just kind of start breaking apart. And if we can go back to gameplay here for a second, this is something that, you know, kind of made my day today. 163 versus Kai 200, the dogfight of the century. I mean, <sighs> historical accuracy at its, at its finest, isn't it? You know, Germany fighting Japan in Korea, <sighs> this is wrong on so many different levels. 
But I gotta admit, it's fun. You know, it's fast paced. It's it's kind of arcadey, to be honest. You know, the 163 is kind of an arcadey aircraft. And if we could have this discussion and going on and on how this plane could have its flat model completely changed and its battle rating reduced. But if you want to push this plane down into the, you know, prop era, you're effectively throwing out a lot of players that simply don't want to face against rocket planes. It's an aircraft that in the minds of many shouldn't even have been introduced if we really want to have, you know, historical balance, quote unquote, because it's a plane that you will never really be able to fairly balance. I was once a, a fan of the idea that what we should do with this plane is simply cap its engine, meaning that you would not give it any control. Let it take off from the airfield, let it have its trolley, but don't give it throttle controls. Don't give it the option of turning it off and gliding, because this plane is a superb glider. If you did that, then you would limit this plane in kind of the same way you limit the me 262 c 2 b that for the first three, or in this case six minutes, the plane would have full top speed, an open throttle that it couldn't be lowered. And that would be a problem on its own. You see, if the enemy team is simply stuck low to the ground, you would break your wings trying to, well, get to them. Because think of it, if you just fly in a straight line with an engine fully open, you can't slow down. You know, you can't go into a turn. The only way to bleed speed would be to go up, to convert speed into altitude. And so that wouldn't work either. And so, really the conclusion of the 163's current matchmaker is that it's fairly balanced. If you remove top performing jets from its matchmaker, this plane is spot on, perfect where it is. The only gripe, the only gripe with this plane that I have is its location. So instead of having it first in line following the K4 and then, you know, leading forward to the 262s, I would actually move it over to the HE162 line. Why? The HE162 is a horrible introductory plane for the MiG-15. As an early jet, it's actually quite half-decent, if you fix the overheating, that is. Putting the 163 between the HE162 and the MiG-15 would do two things. First of all, it would give the pilot who's grinding for the MiG-15 something a little bit faster to fly. It would give him an introductory to these jet matches. But what I find more importantly is it would actually teach him how to lead the guns. Now, Mark 108s and the, you know, 37mm from the MiG-15 aren't, you know, they're not the most comparable things, but they both got slow velocity. They both take a lot of lead. You know, they both follow the same principle. As I said in the MiG-15 video, how do you lead these guns? Well, when you think you're leading enough, lead a bit more, and maybe then you'll be able to actually hit something. And right here is a perfect example of that. I've respawned, and a meteor has gone in to strafe the runway. Now, I'm not going to engage him in a head-on pass. I mean, four Hispanos versus two Mark 108s, I probably could kill him, but not taking the chances. Now, what I was thinking here is that the Meteor was going to go up or escape, try to get some speed up, I mean, anything but go back into a turn. I can only assume he's trying to do another strafe run, so I take lead, fire a quick burst of 10 shells, and somehow his wing pulls off. The, the issue of these 108s, and for me, leading them, especially when using stealth, is that you really are blind shooting. Some of these shells are so slow that many times when going head on using these shells, I've fired, moved away, and for a second I thought I've I missed. And then the enemy plane just blows up. Well, that or I get an immense amount of sparks and hits on them, which is kind of where the love-hate relationship with German cannons comes in. They're reliably unreliable. It's because of the hit detection system, you know? The issue is really with ping. Sometimes when your ping is high, you'll be sparking, but many times what the issue of ping is, is the actual enemy player. You see, people might not know this, might not be aware of it, but it's the enemy's player's ping that's the issue. So whenever there's an American player playing on the European server or the Russian server, he's effectively gonna be a harder target to hit, because he has high ping. Well, at the same time, he's gonna have a harder time hitting you, but it's a difference. Because when you have high ping, it's obvious, you see it on your screen. When the enemy has high ping, you're not aware of it. So, in a way, you could use it as a cheat tactic, but you're also cheating yourself, because you're putting yourself at a disadvantage, so at the end of the day, it's just not worth it. And when it comes down to sparks and hits and weird detections, I'd love to hear more of a, you know, in-depth explanation of how that actually works. And no, I don't want that from you in the comments section, I'd love that as a public statement from Gaijin. And speaking of public statements from Gaijin, I'd also love to know 
how exactly AAA in this game works. Now, this Banshee, if, if you've been keeping an eye on the, on the game here, has already made one pass of the runway. He killed the 163, he made a 180 degree turn, he's now flying just above the runway. He's turning again, there's an F-25 Sabre coming in as well, the AAA is going ham on this guy. He's continuing to turn, I mean, surely he's dead. He's also trying to evade the R-28 in the area, I'm still on his 6, he now does in fact get damaged by AAA because there is something, he's trailing smoke, so it's probably the radiator or the engines that is damaged. I'm closing in, I'm about to take lead, and just before I could fire... Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, not just did I get damaged and nearly killed by my own AAA, it kind of denied me the kill. I just got my kill denied and stolen by my own AAA. By getting hit by it. <laughs> Some things in this game are just better unexplained. I mean, it feels like there's somebody behind there with a button that just is just flipping a coin, and whenever the, you know, whenever it's heads, he presses the button and somebody dies. It's so random. And the issue of AAA really is, and this has been debated before, is that if there's a friendly aircraft chasing an enemy aircraft over the friendly airfield, the AAA actually shouldn't fire. There should be, you know, light machine gun fire concentrated for that aircraft, because otherwise you are in fact risking shooting at your teammate. AAA is often considered to be completely overpowered, and I've got to, I've got to disagree. It's not overpowered. It's just so RNG. It's inconsistent. That's the issue. And maybe it's just that placebo effect of, you know, whenever you're on the enemy runway, you get one shot, and whenever you're being strafed, you know, the enemy plane just makes one pass, he makes a second pass, he makes a third pass, and he's still flying intact. There really is this problem of AAA not being too accurate. And hell, maybe it could have something to do with, well, ping. Maybe the person who's flying with very high ping has a, well, higher chance of not being killed by AAA. Well, regardless of what the case is, something needs to be done with AAA. But what has been fixed, and I've got to say thank you, is the landing of the 163. Now, this is the second time I've landed it, and you might have noticed that neither of the times have I actually used the landing gear. Why? I have a feeling it, it just doesn't really work as well as you might think. Sure, you might damage the engine a little bit when landing on the actual skid without... Well, you see, the trick about the 163 is that when landing without the landing skid, you're still landing on the landing skid, because it's on the bottom of the aircraft. Think of it as landing gear that's there, but, you know, retracted or not, it doesn't make a difference. So, I just land with no landing gear, and it works just fine. But I do use the landing flaps, and I do try to keep the plane stable with the engine turned off to just prevent any kind of chance for, you know, oh look, wing just fell off. And there's one last analogy I have that you're going to love. You're going to love, you're going to laugh at this one so much. But I kind of thought of it as we're going through this video. In Africa, there's, there's a lot of tribes, right? And one of the ways that they get food, one of the ways they hunt food, is by chasing gazelles. Now, a gazelle is an explosive animal. It's, it's an animal that has a lot of power to get from point A to point B fast. So when it's being chased by a lion, the lion will actually have a very hard time catching it because it's so fast. Think of the, think of Usain Bolt, you know? It will go from, you know, 0 to 100 meters rapidly. What, 6.8 seconds? The issue of the gazelle, however, is it's not very durable. It doesn't have that enduring energy. And so what happens is these tribes, these men, they run after the gazelle. Literally, you have a tribe of people who are running after an animal. And funny as it might sound, the animal dies of exhaustion. Because it just keeps running. You know, they basically outrun the gazelle by, you know, squishing out every inch of power that it has. And that's what the 163 is. 163 is the gazelle. For the first six minutes, once you have the power, it is the most powerful, the most nail-biting aircraft you'll have. Or have to face up against. As soon as you've drained it of its power, it, it's dead. Because when you're in glide mode, you're safe, as long as nothing engages you. If you're hidden in a cloud, if you're up at altitude, you're good. You can go back to base, refuel, rearm, but whilst you're out of fuel and in enemy territory, you are an actual sitting duck. A gazelle. I know, it's a weird analogy, but that's what I thought of, because that's the way I've been flying this plane. It's 
They're really down to the personal level. Are you going to use it as a rushing aircraft, the way I do, if you're an aggressive pilot? Or are you going to try the defensive approach? Climbing to altitude, you know, gliding around, trying to find something easy, you know, going for those opportunistic type targets. I find the first one the only way I can fly this plane and have fun and kind of keep sanity having to face up against top tier jets. And if you're still sitting here listening to the video asking yourself, okay, Orange, we get it, you know, it's a gazelle, it's an explosive aircraft, whatever. What tips do you have for us? How do you fly this? I've just gotten it. What do I do with it? Do I just rush in? Do I just head on everything? The thing is, I frankly don't really know. Is I've had this plane for so long, but none of the tactics that on other planes would give you, you know, regular results, that would give you an average every match, that you could, you know, average out one or two kills per match, it never really worked. Because you're so limited to the fuel, the type of the matchmaker, the map you're on, there's no consistency to this plane. And I think that's the one thing that makes it unique and fun to fly. Well, that and not taking enough lead on the Mark 108s. <laughs> that's how bad it is when you don't take lead and you have stealth shells loaded. You know, the basic rules that I would say to any jet, you know, keep it fast, don't turn, fight, don't commit any passes, those are classic, you know, classic rules to flying any jet, or in this case, rocket. Hell, in a way, I don't want to give you any tips on this plane. Not just because I find it hard to find them, you know, from my own flying style, but because the plane is so unique, I think any tactic is applicable to it. You know, you can fly this plane the way you would fly any plane in the game. You could fly it as a turn fighter, you could fly it as a boom and zoomer, you could fly it as an energy fighter. Because it has those characteristics. So it really boils down to you. It boils down to your own personal preference. Think of it more as a customizable training aircraft where you can fly it as any plane that you're going to be unlocking next. So if it's the MiG-15, try rushing combined with energy fighting and boom and zooming. If it's the ME-262 rocket-powered variant, try rushing followed by a very, very hard, sharp climb. And with that said, I can easily conclude that the 163 is a, not just a bad, but a horrible starter jet. Rocket, whatever you want to call it. It's decent at being a tutoring aircraft for giving you an idea how top-tier jet matchmaker works. But just as a plane, on its own, it's actually spectacularly good. And it boils down to whether you're a defensive or an aggressive pilot. If you like defensive flying, sort of like Meteor F Mark 8, you're going to hate this plane. But if you like aggressive flying, rushing in, think me and the MiG-15, then what you're looking at here is an explosive, aggressive, well, MiG-15 that will last you for six minutes. And at that, it's damn good. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think about the ME163 in the comment section down below. But until next time, take care and uh, safe flying. To level out and then have a chance at firing at my lower glances, which will still give me more than enough time to hit him. How about we turn this situation around a bit? I mean, if you're in that T-54 and you know there's a Yak Tiger, what's the last thing you would anticipate him doing? Yeah, that's right. Blitzkrieg. <laughs> And he does his best here, I mean, he puts one shell into me, and of course he bounces with the upper half, and, uh, bye-bye. There's this one very peculiar...